Yeah, so I was at a beach this summer right after that USA Today thing came out, and I was tossing the ball, and there were some, like, you know, 12-year-old boys playing next to me, and I really wanted to go up to them and say, hey, I'm number seven. <laughs> I didn't. No, I might sometime. Um, let me just start with um, some disclosures. Uh, one really important disclosure, and I have to have changed this recently. I used to have a disclosure that I am a football fan, um, and it's really uh, only in the last few months that I've kind of been changing this a little bit, and I guess I, I have to say now I w was a football fan, but this was not too long ago. This was the last real Super Bowl, the one that the Patriots played in in Arizona a year and a half ago. Uh, I was there. That was one of the peak experiences in life. Um, it was an, a very kind of conflicted experience, as was every Sunday that I'd watch this beloved game. Um, so I want you to just take that kind of keep that in mind a little bit. So I'm just going to start off with where the discussion in concussions ha had kind of left off, and that is that there's actually been great strides in sports concussion prevention, awareness, detection, management over the last several years. This is my favorite example of uh, the detection of concussion. Here's another disclosure. I actually know very little about concussions. I uh, am a neurodegenerative disease person. I'm not a concussion uh, expert, though people think I play one on TV. Uh, the, the real people here, like Drs. Brenner, Floyd, Levin, are the experts in concussion. I focus predominantly prior to the last few years on Alzheimer's disease. But here's another very important and kind of um, uh, difficult thing to disclose. I'm actually not very concerned about concussions when it comes to the later life neurodegenerative diseases that I'm going to talk about. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's think about the overall amount of repetitive head impacts. Some of them are just going to be a single or hopefully not more than one moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. And then you've been hearing about the symptomatic mild traumatic brain injuries, concussions. Those just really scratch the surface. It's all that stuff underneath that Dr. Levin was describing about the subconcussive impacts that we just don't know a lot about. What we think they are is an impact to the brain with adequate force to have some kind of effect on neuronal functioning, but without those immediate symptoms of concussion. And there are indeed some sports and some positions that are very prone to it. Think about football linemen. Every play of every game and every practice, what they're doing is they're down in the three-point stance, and they then go head to head. Many of these folks have around 1,000 to 1,500 of these types of hits per season at around 20 to 30 G in force. You think about younger you know, kids who play both sides of the line, it's even more than that. In high school players, it was a, a study by Brolio and colleagues just looking at high school players, not, not college or above, where they put accelerometers in helmets. This is a common way to study this, this type of thing, is by putting these gizmos in helmets to measure the amount of force. And in high school players, in one season, uh, on average, there were 652 hits to the head in excess of 15 G. One player on the team had over 2,000 of those things. College players, it's much higher than that. And now there's growing evidence um, that after one season alone, these repetitive subconcussive hits can indeed lead to cognitive, physiological, structural brain changes. Some of these things Dr. Levin already referred to, including this recent study from Wake Forest. I won't uh, belabor it, but this was a, a scary one, where kids who did not have any concussions, and they were watched closely through the season, um, the amount of hits they got through these measurements through accelerometers was directly associated with the amount of white matter microstructural uh, integrity change using uh, diffusion tensor imaging. All right, so the big question then is, do these concussive and perhaps more importantly subconcussive hits lead to neurodegeneration? The goal is to induce brain injury. Um, and we've actually known for quite a long time that the repeated impacts to the head that boxers get actually do have some long-term consequences. Back in 1928, 
uh, in our beloved Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, uh, there was an article called Punch Drunk, in which the long-term consequences of boxing was described with such wonderfully scientific terms as goofy and slug nutty. Um, and as the person uh, got older, they required institutionalization in an asylum for dementia. That was then referred uh, in 1937 as dementia pugilistica, the dementia of pugilists, of, of boxing. But it was back in 1940 that the term chronic traumatic encephalopathy was first used and then more ru uh, routinely after 1957. And in fact, the neuropathological changes associated with this dementia from boxing uh, uh, in, in terms of CTE have been described uh, starting in the 50s and then more extensively in the 70s. But it wasn't until a beloved American football player died and was diagnosed by Dr. Bennett Omalu that things started to change. And that uh, Mike Webster, who was a Pittsburgh Steeler, who had this awful spiraling out of control life the last couple of years of his life, uh, died and his brain was studied um, and was found to have CTE. So what is CTE? It is a neurodegenerative disease that is very similar to Alzheimer's disease in many ways, but it's unique both neuropathologically and in some ways clinically. It seems to be associated with having a history of repetitive head impacts, including those concussions and subconcussive hits. And what we think is going on is that at the time of that repetitive trauma, there's the beginning of a cascade of events that eventually leads to progressive neurodegeneration. It does not seem to be pro, uh, uh, prolonged post-concussion syndrome, as was described earlier. It's not the cumulative effects of concussions or injury where you get one, then you get another, and then you keep getting worse and worse. It's not actually a brain injury. It's a disease, and that disease seems to begin earlier in life, but the symptoms often don't begin until years or decades after the person stops getting hit and then continue to worsen as the areas of the brain start to be destroyed. And like Alzheimer's and all other neurodegenerative diseases, even in 2016, CTE can really only currently be diagnosed following death. My colleague, Dr. McKee, and that was uh, referred to before, has examined more brains with CTE than any other neuropathologist, and uh, her brain bank at, at our uh, BU Center has examined somewhere over 350 brains at this point. I'm not really sure of the number. And really, her work has defined the neuropathology of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And what it is, is it's a disease that's characterized by an abundance of a misfolded, hyperphosphorylated form of the microtubule-associated protein tau. In, when that occurs in these uh, individuals, there are neurofibrillary as well as astrocytic tangles that develop. But what the unique and pathognomonic lesion of this disease is, that's different from any other disease, is that the tau deposits around small blood vessels at the depths of the cortical sulci. A uh, panel uh, was convened by NINDS um, through Dr. McKee's work where they uh, came up with a consensus diagnosis of the neuropathology of CT. And it included this perivascular, so right here that's a small blood vessel, and everything that's brown is stained with an AT8 stain for, uh, for phosphorylated tau. Uh, and at the depths of the cortical cell size, so that's a, a sulcus, and here's the deposition of the aberrant tau. That's the pathognomonic lesion of it. But it doesn't just stop there. This is just a, a photo scan of a, a brain um, a slice that's uh, stained for uh, the tau. So you can see it building up in the depths of the cortical cell sci. And this brain later on, this was actually of a, uh, a rugby player, world-class uh, rugby player uh, from Australia who died after years of dementia. He had uh, a, de a completely devastated brain from uh, CTE. There's no amyloid for those of you who know Alzheimer's disease. There was nothing else in there except for CTE. So what does it look like clinically? Well, this is uh, kind of going along with the things you heard uh, previously by Dr. Brenner and Dr. Levin. Uh, there are multiple symptoms and signs, and it's really hard to figure out what's kind of specific to this disease or not. So yes, there are changes in mood, but there's all kinds of people who have these types of changes. There's changes in behavior, especially a short fuse and impulse control difficulties and aggression. Changes in cognitive functioning that include episodic memory impairment as well as executive dysfunction and eventually dementia that can indeed look very similar to the clinician's eye um, to an Alzheimer's disease 
uh, dementia. Just want to make this a little kind of uh, specific with a case example. This was actually a few years ago, the case, first case that our group had um, of a deceased individual. This was um, John Grimsley. John uh, tragically died at age 45. He was a linebacker, pretty good one. And uh, you have to know that after he retired from the NFL, he was a very avid hunting and fishing guy. That's important to know because he knew his way around firearms. But for the five years prior to his death, um, he started having progressive short fuse, impulsivity, awful memory decline. And one night he was home alone and he was cleaning his guns like he would do on a regular basis and he apparently neglected to take out the ammunition as he was cleaning it and shot himself in the chest and died. It was um, extensively examined as, uh, and determined not to be a suicide. So here's John Grimsley's brain at the age of 45. On the top is um, not microscopically enhanced, just the brown stuff you can see is abnormal world tau. Underneath, you can see a, a small section of that uh, enhanced. The large things are the, the neurofibrillary tangles, and then there's uh, these uh, neuritic threads and these dot-like um, substances. Put it in perspective, that's a 65-year-old healthy individual uh, that's what the person's supposed to look like with no tau. Greater perspective, this was a 73-year-old um, professional and uh, a, a champion boxer who died after several years in a, uh, an inpatient facility with uh, the diagnosis of dementia pugilistica, and sure enough, that's what he had. All right, so those pictures paint a thousand words, right? They're pretty impressive. And those neuropathological findings of CT in athletes have had this incredible impact on public policy, awareness. I mean, it seems to be, you know, people can actually say the word encephalopathy, which is amazing. <laughs> and yet the public, I believe, thinks that the science of CT is much more advanced than it really is. This is really what's been going on over the last eight years or so. You know, our, our group alone, we've been on the cover of all these things. I got to be on 60 Minutes. I mean, that's cool, folks, but the science doesn't move like that. In the best of circumstances, science doesn't move that quickly, and these past several years, sadly, have not been the best of, of scientific funding. And so, you know, I used to say that we're really in the infancy of our scientific knowledge of CT. I've changed that. I think now, at this point, we're in the toddlerhood. But we still have a tremendous amount to know. Like, is it common? Do we have a public health issue here? We just really don't know. So yes, there's been reports that 90 out of 94 professional football players at our brain bank had CT. Well, obviously that's biased. We know it's biased. It's supposed to be a biased uh, brain bank. And so there's been a, an important, uh, more recent study of a larger unbiased sample from a larger brain bank where starting at 1,700 or so men um, in this uh, larger neurodegenerative, neurodegeneration brain bank, they looked at people who had a history of traumatic brain injury uh, or contact sports. To jump to kind of the conclusion, what they found was 21 out of 26 former amateur contact sport athletes. These are folks who predominantly played football, only up through the college uh, level, if that, had the unique pathology of CTE. And it was never seen in anyone who had a single traumatic brain injury. All right, so if it were just um, professional football players, I'm not sure it would be as big a deal for the Society for Neuroscience to be looking at right now. Is it something more? Well, it's been found in at least uh, a, around 250 individuals, including a bunch of professional athletes uh, across these different uh, um, sports. In hockey, it's only been found in the enforcers, the boxers on ice. But it's also been found in people who didn't ever play in the pros, college football players, many college football players, some high school football players. It's also been found in the military, um, in our, in our um, uh, servicemen who uh, returned with a bunch of different diagnoses like Dr. Brenner was talking about, with PTSD, with a, a prior TBI, with exposure to multiple blasts, who knows what was going on and who knows what kind of experience or exposure they had to football or boxing prior to or during their military uh, um, history. But we've also seen it across the age span, as even including down to age 17. So the question then is, why do some people get it and some people not? One thing that we do know is that all neuropathologically confirmed cases of CT have had one thing in common. They've all had a history of repetitive head impacts. So what does that translate into? It means that that type of exposure is a necessary 
variable to get this disease, but obviously it's not sufficient. Not everyone who hits their head a bunch is going to get this neurodegenerative disease. So we have to figure out what the risk factors are. Are there genetics? Well, we've done some preliminary work, others have too, to um, think that maybe there's some increased susceptibility in a few different genes, but more studies need to be done. But what about the exposure? What about that um, the types of hits, the severity of the trauma, the amount of rest in between, or the overall duration of getting hit, or the total just number of hits that people get, or perhaps the age that someone starts getting hit. One of the questions that we asked was what, if any, are the long-term consequences of repeated hits to the head that happen during critical neurodevelopmental milestones? And so here's just a kind of a smattering of some of the things that Dr. Levin was talking about. During the ages of 9 to 12, there's this unbelievable development and maturation that's going on in the brain, including a lot of white matter maturation. And so a, a PhD student of mine at the time uh, led a study or a couple of studies looking at this issue of does getting hit during a, that time period increased the risk for later life problems. So the first thing she addressed was whether um, if you get hit before age 12 over and over again through tackle football, does that increase um, having problems with cognitive functioning later in life? So we looked at a bunch of former NFL players, 42 NFL players who were paired. So 21 pairs, one guy started playing tackle football before age 12, one guy who started playing at age 12 or older. And they were we controlled for current age, for the total duration of play, et cetera. And what happened was we found that the guys who started playing before age 12 had significantly worse cognitive functioning in, um, uh, using measures of executive impairment as well as new learning. So then the question was, are there also structural changes associated with this type of early um, exposure to tackle football? So Julie Stam, uh, the same uh, PhD student at the time, uh, followed up on that initial um, paper by collaborating with some close colleagues of mine, uh, Dr. Martha Shenton, Inga Kurta, uh, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And what we did was we looked at diff um, diffusion tensor imaging um, of the corpus callosum. And for those of you who don't work in um, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, unfortunately it does not come color coded. I wish it did. Um, but uh, what we did was we looked at specific areas um, in terms of where the tracks uh, lead to. Uh, to kind of just summarize what the findings were is that the guys who started playing before age 12 had altered microstructural integrity of the anterior corpus callosum compared to the ones who started at age 12 or older. And so, is that kind of the big deal? No, it's a very unique cohort. Those were professional football players in middle age. What about the people who only play up through high school or college? We also weren't studying CTE. It was part of a larger study trying to d d um, create biomarkers for CTE, but that wasn't saying these folks have CTE. It's just saying what about long-term consequences of getting your head hit over and over again during that time period? So is that adequate scientific evidence to stop youth tackle football? Still stopping. Go, go! Oh, oh my up. gosh. <laughs> Still stopping. Go, go! They're oh. eight years old. So the next, stop in, next uh, step in studying exposure is to try to come up with some estimate of the total number of hits someone gets throughout their career of, in this case, football. So, um, a group of, of my collaborators, an exposure scientist, Dr. Mike McLean, a biostatistician, Yorgos Tripodis, um, and an MD-PhD student of mine at the time, uh, Philip Montenegro, um, did a study where we tried to develop a metric to quantify overall cumulative exposure to repetitive head impacts. Uh, we came up with a cool name, CHII, the, the CHI index, and we um, tried to use that to examine an association between overall repetitive head impact exposure and long-term outcomes. Um, I won't go into too much detail because of time, but it was a bunch of people who, um, were, who had only played up through high school or college football and were now examined later in life, sometime in mid-age. And they had cognitive assessment and a bunch of uh, measures of depression, apathy, um, dis, uh, behavioral discontrol. And we looked at the levels of these things, of cognitive impairment, depression, et cetera, that were above clinically meaningful cutoffs. So this wasn't just a correlational study. It was looking at, okay, what about risk for 
true clinical impairment. And what we found was there was a dose-response relationship. This was a, just a, the um, relationship with depression, that after you get past this threshold of around 1,800 hits, the more hits you got, the greater the risk for later life depression. Same thing with cognitive impairment. Up to around 7,200 hits, there was no increased risk, and then this dose-response relationship. So critical next steps to do, figure out a bunch more of these things is to diagnose CTE during life. To me, that's the biggest thing. Because then we can try to figure out how to differentiate CTE from all these other potential things, like Alzheimer's, other, other neurodegenerative diseases, PTSD, or persistent symptoms of repetitive or single mild tra uh, traumatic brain injury, or going back to those idiopath, I mean, those you know, kind of routine idiopathic things like uh, depression and aggressive behavior. How can we figure out, especially earlier in life, what's caused by this specific tauopathy and what's caused by other things? Well, coming up with a diagnosis might, uh, might do that. It might also be able to help us understand that public health issue. What's the true incidence and prevalence of the disease? And then we can also, if we could diagnose it during life, try to figure out much more clearly what those risk factors are, both the genetic, the exposure variables, and others that uh, we don't know yet. And then perhaps most importantly, we'd be able to start some clinical trials of new compounds or other techniques to be able to treat the symptoms, but also hopefully even prevent the disease or the symptoms in the first place. And so the steps required to come up with an in vivo diagnosis usually start with understanding what the clinical presentation is. So in this case, what we did was we went back to the people who we knew had the disease neuropathologically and um, tried to understand what they were like during life. Then we tried to refine and create a diagnostic criteria, a, a way to say, yeah, this person meets these provisional criteria um, to, for this clinical presentation associated with this disease. But most importantly, in order to figure out whether the clinical presentation is CTE or not, we'd need to have some type of objective biological markers or biomarkers. And so the first step always in biomarker development is develop a really great acronym. I'm sure everyone out here who does biomarker work knows you have to start with a good acronym. We did. This is going to win me the Nobel Prize in acronym development. I think you'd agree that's pretty darn good. Um, the, the more boring um, R01 uh, uh, title of the grant was that on the top. We were fortunate to get funding from a few different institutes uh, a few years ago. And what we did was we brought in 100 former NFL players into Boston for two or three days, as well as some controls who had no CT risk, meaning they uh, might have played sports but no contact sports. They never had traumatic brain injury or reported concussions. And they went through a, you know, an unbelievable amount of, of different types of measures of neuroimaging with my colleagues at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. We did lumbar punctures with everyone, EEGs using the brain scope technology technology, got DNA for genetic studies, and they had neurologic exams, motor assessments, cognitive assessments, psychiatric interviews, you name it. But when we started, there were no measures of blood tau or brain tau, even on the horizon. So where we are now is that the study stopped um, a few months ago, and we're now Either we have published or we're in the midst of looking at a bunch of cool key findings using magnetic resonance imaging, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, um, going over all these different things with some neat findings, but they're probably just proxies for the tauopathy. These things aren't going to detect the tau um, part of this disease. So fortunately, before we finished, there was the development of a new way to actually see this paired helical filament tau in the brain while people are alive using a PET ligand. Uh, this, in this case, it's called AV1451. It used to be called T807. And we were able to do this in 20 former NFL players and 10 controls. And I'll show you some very preliminary findings. Um, some larger uh, real findings are being uh, completed for uh, publication right now from a larger study with colleagues at, um, uh, in Arizona. But this is really what it was all about. So these, uh, this is just an example of, of one of the 20 uh, former NFL players, um, and you can kind of detect where these hot spots are in the brain, uh, where the uh, ligand is, is being bound. 
give you another view of it, this coronal slice, um, these are the hot spots where it seems to be tau. I'll give you a little reminder of what the neuropathology looked like. This is a slice of a, a brain of a deceased individual where the abnormal tau is found, where? In the depths of the cortical sulci. And that's indeed where we're finding it using this PET scan technique. But what about a blood test? Because wouldn't it be cool if we could have some way of having surveillance, you know, in, in you know, all you know, trips to the doctor at a certain age. Who knows what some less expensive, less invasive way to be able to detect this. It would not be specific diagnosis of CTE, but it would be a good way to, to say, hey, there's something going on. Well, we've done now um, a few different studies of different types of uh, blood-based biomarkers. Uh, in, in one case, looking at plasma, total tau, using the Quanteric Samoa platform. That There's a bunch of papers here this week. Um, in one case, uh, this is a publication of ours uh, recently, where we looked at exosomes, and we measured the amount of tau in plasma inside these exosomes, which are these nanovesicles that apparently came from the brain itself. So the next step um, that I'll, I'll leave you with is um, obviously to develop yet another great acronym, because those were just the preliminary things. And so, yes, indeed, I was able to come up with another dynamite acronym. Um, and again, the grant name is not as exciting, but we were fortunate to get a $16 million grant from NIH recently, and I am just the luckiest person alive having these kind of superstars as my co-principal investigators. But we also have 50 collaborators around the country at 10 different research institutions, and we're going to be um, seeing people uh, at four different sites around the country uh, looking at males between the ages of 45 and 74, and uh, former NFL players, former college players, some controls. Um, and indeed, we've actually started. Uh, this was from a couple weeks ago, one of our first uh, uh, scans. And actually, you can see in this one, um, this gentleman, you can make it out a little bit, had um, a cavum septum pellucidum, also has some encephalomalacia here in the right temporal uh, lobe. So I just want to leave you with um, kind of a couple important things. One is, where does this take us in the future? Well, as an Alzheimer's researcher, one of our key things that we're trying to do is to detect that disease earlier in life before there's even symptoms, because if you wait until there's too much neurodegeneration, it's a lot harder to do something about, especially with disease-modifying agents. Well, now there are anti-tau compounds on the horizon right now. And if this is the typical course of CT, where it starts before there's any symptoms, but that cascade of events has occurred, then there's the mild symptoms, and then someone might have dementia and continues to decline. Rather than start after the person is demented, uh, if we can move that up by early detection with biomarkers, then it turns into prevention. The last thing I want to just say is um, maybe something that will sp um, spawn a little discussion. Uh, human beings, us homo sapiens, have been around for 200,000 years. Um, and so I want you to think about the history of human beings hitting their head over and over again. Uh, it wasn't until the 1950s that boxers started having padded boxing gloves. That was to prevent the hand from breaking from the person who's doing the hitting. So boxing has been around for a thousand years or so, but it never really involved repeated hits to the head because it would hurt too much on both sides. But here's the more important thing. It wasn't until the 1950s and early 1960s that in American football, um, these hard plastic helmets with face masks started to be used. Not until the 50s and 60s. And they were used in order to do ver a very, very important thing, and that was prevent death from skull fracture. And they did that job really well. But they didn't stop the brain from moving inside that skull. And in fact, it likely allowed people to not feel pain when they hurt themselves, hit themselves over and over again. And then it wasn't until the late 1960s and early 1970s that Pop Warner football um, really began, and we started having hit kids hit their heads across the country uh, starting at age six. And so this final thought for you is a public health um, thought that the individuals who began playing college football um, with hard plastic helmets and face masks are only now in their mid-70s. And the people who started hitting their heads in tackle football prior to high school are only now in their late 50s and 60s. 
And so the question then comes is, are, do we have a problem coming up? Because in the 200,000 year history of, of humans, it's only in the last 50 to 75 years that we've hit our heads repeatedly and allowed our children to do so as well. So we really just don't know what lies ahead. And I'll just leave it with this. If you can't see it in the back, it says, I read that story about dementia and former NFL players. Maybe we should reconsider this. <laughs> These are the people who do all the work. I just get to tell jokes. Thank you very much.